At the same time, this question of which is central to Reconstruction is being fought over, which is the transition from slave labor to free labor. You know, you can say we're abolishing slavery, but what will take its place? That is not a very easy question to answer. The Civil War sees what Willie Lee Rose many, many years ago in a great book of the 1960s called Rehearsals for Reconstruction. Experiments in free labor in various parts of the South that kind of set the stage for what will happen once the war is over. The most highly publicized, there are three major rehearsals for Reconstruction. The most highly publicized took place on the Sea Islands. I've mentioned the Sea Islands. Remember, they're down here, these wonderful islands, um, between Charleston and Savannah, really closer to Savannah, the Sea Islands here, occupied just, off the, just slightly off the coast of South Carolina and Georgia. They had been the center of big plantations, the so-called Sea Island cotton, which is a very fine form of cotton, only grown there. Um, and um, also, this, the main city there is Beaufort, a beautiful place. I don't know if anyone's ever been there. It's a little off the beaten path, but it's a lovely city with a lot of civil, you know, old pre-Civil War houses, and a lovely place to visit if you want to be there. Anyway, as soon as the Union Army or Navy conquers or captures Port Royal, Hilton had these little islands, um, that's the end of 1861. Reconstruction begins right there. And it becomes highly publicized because a group of northern reformers called the Gideonites, after Gideon's band in the Bible, this is 50 or 60 men and women teachers, and black and white teachers, philanthropists, they go down to the Sea Islands, abolitionists basically, to help in the transition from slavery to freedom. They set up schools for the first time down there they, to educate the freed people, and they try to assist them in uh, you know, becoming free laborers. They're not the only ones who go down. Northern investors also turn up, cotton investors who want to get a hold of these plantations. The price of cotton, remember, is sky high in the Civil War, and it's very if they can get cotton production going again on the Sea Islands using free labor, Everyone will make a lot of money, and the blacks will get wages. And moreover, says Edward Atkinson, the, who's down there, the representative of northern cotton companies, um, it will prove the superiority of free labor. We will prove that it's more effective to have these black people growing cotton with, by, in freedom than as slaves. So everyone is trying to prove something in the uh, Sea Islands. Uh, many of them are very paternalistic toward these former slaves. They need guidance, they need instruction, they need someone to tell them what to do. Um, yet, most of these blacks seem to have admired these teachers and other people very much. They were certainly very anxious for education. They flocked to these schools. Um, and uh, as to the northern investors, it was a little more complicated because the blacks wanted land. They didn't want to go to work for new employers on the plantations. They wanted their own land. That's what they told General Sherman, remember, at the colloquy, give us land. Well, this is even before that. And this is one of the few places where some of them did get a hold of land. Um, because, if, because um, let me just show you this little chart here. Where is it? There we go. This is a, it, because some land was actually sold by the army on the Sea Islands because the federal government, we'll talk about this down the road, but the federal government during the war levied a tax on landed property. And if you don't pay your taxes, the government can come and seize your property, right? Well, this tax applies to the whole country, the direct tax, they call it. But Southerners are not paying this tax to the federal government, right? So most land in the South is actually subject, possibly, to seizure for non-payment of taxes. Well, this is irrelevant. In most of the South, it was not under Union control. But here on the Sea Islands, they actually have what they call tax sales. The government takes the land, says, hey, no one has paid their tax. We're going to auction it off. And 
some of these philanthropists convinced Lincoln to allow blacks to preempt some of the land. In other words, some, they can grab little pieces of land for themselves before it's gobbled up by the northern investors. So here's a map from 1864 of a plantation with these little preemption plots. Those are, there's like, what is it? 17 men and one woman, a, a widow, a black woman, have preempted and they're getting these little plots of land. This is the plantation of who? J.F. Chaplin, which is being auctioned off for non-payment of taxes. And here, little plots of land are actually being acquired by local black people. It happens on the Sea Islands. It doesn't happen in a lot of other places, but it happens on the Sea Islands. Now, has anyone ever been on the Sea Islands, by the way? Ever been down there? Hmm. Yeah, you have. Right. It's pretty cool, right? What do they have mostly down there now? Golf, Golf courses. Thank you. <laughs> Here's the New York Times, folks. 36 hours in Hilton Head. Hilton Head is just to the south of uh, Port Royal and Beaufort and everything. It looks very nice. The island is deemed one of the world's top golf resorts by readers of Golf Digest. Very important. And it tells you there's a whole page where to eat, where to go and look at the beach, where to play golf. Nothing about the history of this area in this full page travel report in the New York Times, although a lot of important history actually was worked out on those islands, and we'll see when we get to Reconstruction, it's very, very important. But no, but you can get lunch there at uh, somebody, Chef David's Roast Fish, and I don't know. Anyway, that's Hilton Head. Um, Beaufort, though, I, I prefer Beaufort, but that's all right. That's one experiment, rehearsal for Reconstruction. A second one, as I mentioned, takes place in the Mississippi Valley under General Banks where plantations are leased to northerners or loyal planters are allowed to run them. The former slaves and escaped slaves, the so-called contrabands, are put to work on these plantations for low wages, three to five dollars a month. The system was very disappointing for the blacks, but it didn't work very well for the planters either. If there's constant conflict on the plantation, you're not going to grow a lot of crops. Um, neither the blacks nor the planters were satisfied. Then there was a third rehearsal for Reconstruction, maybe most interesting, although not a blueprint for what comes later. This takes place at a, pl at a, a place called Davis Bend. Do we have, no, we don't have our, wait, let me see if we can find our map of, uh, mm, yeah, here, War in the West. Davis Bend is up here in Mississippi, on the Mississippi River. It is literally a little peninsula of land formed by the circuitous wanderings of the Mississippi River. This is where Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, and his brother, Joseph Davis, had big cotton plantations at Davis Bend. And you know, the interesting thing about them is that they were very enlightened slave owners as those things go. Joseph Davis was a follower of the French utopian socialist Fourier and tried to run his plantations as a kind of cooperative uh, socialistic uh, kind of experiment, like a commune or a, a communitarian settlement like they had in the North, um, where, the, where the slaves would basically work by themselves. They had their own little court system. He didn't punish people. If people broke the rules, a little slave court decided. And in fact, um, in Reconstruction, I, wanted, in my, I found that there was a petition by a bunch of slaves for the, uh, former slaves, for the release of Jefferson Davis for, from prison, in which they say, yeah, you know, we didn't really like the guy because he was fighting to keep us all in slavery, but he did have a reputation as a very kind owner. So slaves made these distinctions. And the, all right, however, when the Union Army, now Davis is off in Richmond. When the Union Army arrives at Davis Bend, Joseph Davis flees, and he tells his slaves, you love me, don't you? Come on with me. But they all decide to stay. They don't like him that much. <laughs> they stay, and General Grant appoints a northern minister, John Eaton, as his sort of superintendent of Negro affairs, it's called. And he says, I want you to go to Davis Bend, this is Grant's words, and make it a Negro paradise. How do we do that? Divide up the land among the blacks. Let them run the plantations. 
And that's what happens in Davis Bend in 1864 and 65. It's a very big place. Little groups of, of, sla of former slaves farm it cooperatively, market the crop, and they actually make a lot of money because the price of cotton is way high and they make pretty good profits. Um, so this is another model, maybe, for reconstruction. Maybe, why don't they do what they did at Davis Bend all around the South? That's what Sherman seems to be doing with his field order, remember, uh, uh, of uh, setting aside land for black 40 acres and a mule. Nobody knows if this is what's going to happen when the war is over, but my point is that these interrelated issues of land and labor, what kind of labor system, who's going to have access to the land, are on the agenda as the Civil War is coming toward an end. And it's being debated in Washington. The War Department sets up what they call the American Freedmen's Inquiry Commission. Three major northern reformers, Robert Dale Owen, Samuel Gridley Howe, and um, James McKay, travel around the South interviewing people. They write a report which is a good example of the conflicting ideas. On the one hand, they take a kind of laissez-faire attitude. Um, Blacks are in danger of a kind of paternalistic control. Just free them and let them be. They're capable of living in freedom and don't think the government has to establish guardianship over them. But McKay says, no, no, that doesn't, that's not going to work. We got to confiscate the land and give, you want them to be really free, give them land. That's a minority position of these three men, but it's out there. And this report inspires Congress at the very end of its session in March 1865 to um, establish the Freed Men's Bureau. They establish a national organization, a government organization, to oversee the transition from slavery to freedom, the Freed Men's Bureau. Its official title, its full title, this is what we call it, but the full title is Bureau of Freed Men refugees, that's whites who have been displaced, and abandoned land, linking the fate of the freed people and these white refugees with abandoned land. The Freedmen's Bureau bill says the government can rent land to the former slaves, not give it to them, but at least make it available to them. Whether that'll happen, we will see. But at the end of the war, these issues, as I say, are on the agenda.